working to try to uh, sabotage our uh, our pastoring here. Uh, but Ken has a, an area here of also your jaw would uh, need that in order to to talk, and uh, so he's sidetracked for a while. And so in the meantime, he found us a real star. And uh, so this morning we're going to have Nathan Tripp. Nathan, come on up. And uh, Nathan be delivering the mes- message this morning to us, okay? Yeah, well, I really appreciate the opportunity to get to, to lead the, the worship uh, for, for most of July. I didn't make it all the way through, um, uh, so I appreciate you, Brother Jim, uh, coming through and leading us. Uh, I'm going to follow up today with something that Pastor Ken has been talking about pretty heavily in the book of Acts. Uh, but I'm leaving uh, the book of Acts because I, I think that that's his baby. I'm going to let him finish that out. Uh, but today, if there is a title for today's message, it's Your Story Is. Uh, I'm used to working with children and teenagers, so I know their memories are not the best. That is not a reflection on you, but me as a teacher. So take that for what it is. Uh, this is my. This is just how I t- teach. I want you to be able to remember it and tell someone what it was after the fact. So here we go, the whole message, if you want it summed up, if you're taking notes, I'll say this and it'll be on the screen. Your story is God's story, Moses' story, and our story. Very, very simple. God's, Moses, ours. That's it. Uh, And we're done. We're dismissed. Great job, everyone. No, uh, (laughs) we're going to be looking at Exodus 15 today. It's one of the first songs of the Bible. Uh, Like I said, I've been leading the songs here. Uh, My undergrad degree is in worship and pastoral studies. That's a lot of fun for me to talk about the hymns, talk about songs, how they were written. This one is absolutely fascinating. Um, But as Pastor Ken was setting me up to this, I want to say that not all of us know why we talk about telling stories. And there's a little bit of church jargon, if you will, that is not familiar to someone who is outside the church walls. And so I'm going to use the word story, but what I'm referring to here is your testimony. Your testimony. The, The way that God has saved you. Because ultimately, God is the hero of your story of your testimony. It's, it's up to him to do the impossible, miraculous work of saving you. Amen? Yeah, okay. Just making sure we're, we're awake this morning. Great. Uh, I also am a little bit involved in how I like to teach. Uh, I was telling uh, Ms. Lesta earlier, my first job out of college was as a Bible teacher uh, to middle schoolers and high school students. And you would imagine they are a little bit just squirrel, dis- distracted. And so I, I like to keep you involved. If I ask you a question, I'm usually looking for a response. Uh, That's just good things to know about me. Uh, But I do want to go ahead and and start into this and say that your story is God's story. The beauty about being in a church that has been around for a while and uh, with folks um, uh, uh, who have been familiar with the story here of of what God is doing. Let's see. Where's Bethany? Where, Where might you be? You're up there. You're up there. I'm going to let you take control just so I don't have to know how to work a remote. I don't know how to work a remote control. But we'll go ahead and talk about how your story is God's story. Here we go. Uh, We're going to get to these words in just a second. But I want to reflect on this as a church for a moment. Uh, God's story. God's big story starts at the very beginning. In the beginning, right? God saw uh, God is making things for the very first time. You could say that God's story is a story of goodness, that God is so good, he created. Out of the overflow of who he is, he created everything good. And so day one, you get to the end of it, right? We have daytime. That sounds like a pretty good thing. Light, what a wonderful idea. That's good. Trees, those are good. Birds, fish, good things. Get to the end of day six, we have people along with the animals scurrying around on the ground. All good things. Get to the end of day seven, Genesis 131. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Yeah, okay, right. We're, we're, we're getting it. So God is so good that he created, and he created things good. He created us to be good. And not just that, he created us to carry that goodness to the whole world. It just started out in a little garden, right? Maybe it was a pretty extravagant garden, a little better than your backyard. But this was a garden, and it was meant to grow. The first people, when they were created, they were made as gardeners. You're made to work the ground. Yeah, it's going to grow. Just 
put in a little bit of effort here, but you have God helping you out, designing you to spread this garden and make a worldwide garden. That sounds pretty great. Plenty to eat, lots to go around. The lions don't want to eat you. It's very good. <laughs> but uh, more than that, that good creation turned against God. God's not done here. His goodness keeps on going, that he sends something, someone into the world to do something about all that's gone wrong. Someone so good that he could fix every single thing that had been bad, had been evil even. This is, of course, Jesus. And Jesus is so good that he gives his goodness to you. That's amazing. If that's not amazing, I, I, I don't know what could be more mind-blowing that someone else's good works. I imagine being in school, you have not studied for, a, 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 I don't know, chemistry, and you have this exam with all these tiny little numbers and letters, and you're supposed to remember sodium chloride, sodium chloride, salt. Got it. Oh, you didn't study. Are you going to remember it? No, but someone did. The valedictorian is in your class. When I was in, in high school, I had the valedictorian and the salutatorian, both in my chemistry class. I only failed one class in high school, and it was only one semester, chemistry. If one of them would have taken their paper, scratched out their name, and written Nate Tripp, handed it to the teacher, I would have done everything to make that happen. I would have been buying their lunch for the rest of the school year, just, do you need anything? Do you need a ride home? Can I take you somewhere? Uh, just because I, I couldn't do it. But that's what Jesus does for us. He floods us with his goodness. Maybe you can think about it this way, that Jesus is so good, he brings God to us. And then more than that, he brings us to God. He just floods our life with goodness, goodness that was not our own, that was alien from us, and then brings us to that goodness. That's called eternal life. And it's the story of God. It is God's story. And so we're going to see that in this first song in the Bible as God's people have just been rescued out of Egypt, out of slavery for over 400 years now. And the first thing they do when they realize we're free, the Red Sea has closed over on top of all of their enemies. They are far from being enslaved. Even the king of that kingdom is now dead in the waters. And here you have God's people who realize what's happening. Like it just dawns on them for the first time. And like we just sang a little bit, you can't stay silent. And so I don't know if they had a rehearsal. I don't know if there was choir practice right beforehand. But we're told that the Israelites sang. Something we're not going get to get to is there's even a chorus. There's a praise chorus that Miriam, Moses' sister, leads in singing. All the women have tambourines. Did anyone bring a tambourine? This is okay. Not every church does. It's okay. But this is a response to how God has acted towards them. And here's what we read in Exodus 15. Um, if you're curious, this is the Christian Standard Bible. I chose this because it's easier than Hebrew. Everyone got that? Okay, great. Okay. No, there are plenty of great translations here. Um, but this is the one I went with. Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. He has thrown the horse and its rider into the sea. Six hundred chariots chased down the people of Israel. You would have think this was the ancient tank coming after a million women and children and their livestock, all their worldly possessions, a million of them crossing the sea, and you have these ancient tanks chasing them down. The horse and its rider have been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength. There's, no, there's nothing in me. I don't have the, the muscle to make this happen. I can't make the donkey walk any faster. I can't cure the diseases within myself. I can't break the shackles off or escape from the one who's pursuing me. He's become my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is a testimony. It is. This is my God, and I will praise him. What a commitment there. My father's God, and I will exalt him. I'm going to read this last verse, and we're going to take a pause. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. That's verse 3. I love this so much. Uh, if you have your physical copy of the Bible, not all those letters are capitalized there. 
uh, the Lord, L-O-R-D, are all capitalized. I wonder why that is. Uh, if you have ever wondered, and look at your Bible, maybe in the Psalms is where this happens most often. Um, all, always, uh, when you have God's name, Yahweh, in the Bible, they don't spell that out for you. Instead, they say this is too holy of a name, too hallowed of a name, is that a better word? Too uh, uh, revered of a name to write out. Instead, we're going to say what it means for us. He's in charge. He's the boss. He's the Lord. And that's why in the New Testament, whenever people refer to Jesus as Lord, they're saying something much more than he's telling me what to do, but that he is God. He's the covenant God of the Bible who made this unending promise to save his people and rescue them to perfect salvation. That's who Jesus is when they refer to him as Lord. But in the Old Testament here, they're thinking back at Exodus 3, when Moses finally hears What's the name? How do I convince this people? Who should I say is going to rescue them? Tell them Yahweh is coming to rescue them. Tell them Yahweh is going to save them. What does that name mean? I am. I am that I am. It's one of the only places in the Bible where it's spelled out for you what it means. And then every other time, you just have this capital letters, L-O-R-D. I am who I have always been. Maybe you've heard this referred to as the great I am. And it's not a title, it's a name. God's saying, here is the greatest part of my identity that you need to know me about, that you need to know about me, is that I won't change. I'm always for you. I'm always loving you. When I was uh, six years old, just to tell you uh, my brief story here, um, and how God is the savior of my story, the hero of my story. Um, I had parents who were very loving and kind to make sure that I knew God's story. And I knew God's goodness. Uh, but more than that, they wanted to make sure that I knew Jesus' goodness and that it could be mine. All I had to do was ask him. Well, I'm five, six years old, and I don't really think that's a need for me. Why would I need someone else's goodness, mom and dad? I'm the good child. I have two brothers, um, and I'm sure I would regularly refer to them as the lesser of the brothers, uh, especially as a five-year-old, my goodness. Uh, but in uh, the summer after my first year of kindergarten, uh, I went to what's called Vacation Bible School. Are you all familiar? Uh, so a week long at the church, there's some kind of theme that focuses on a a part of who God is, and we focused on God as the creator. And so the theme was called Star Quest, and the verse was John 3, 16, for God so loved the world. That's right. It's a big story. It's God's story, a massive story. Everyone, God loved the world that he sent Jesus, his one and only son, that anyone who would believe in him would not perish. Mm -mm. To die is not to perish not disappear from all existence, but instead have eternal life. So that hit me. But I've heard that before. That's not new. God loves. Ah, big deal. I know that. Bring out the sponges. Put the sponges on my shoes so I can feel like I'm in outer space. Because I was remember it was Star Quest. And so they showed us these pictures from the Hubble telescope. Uh, first time these pictures had really been sent and seen by the public. And you are not just seeing our solar system, which is great. It's pretty vast. Uh, these beautiful pictures of Saturn and Jupiter, amazing. But then they get pictures outside of our galaxy. Do you remember some of these for the first time when they hit? You saw multiple galaxies next to one another, these spiraling, swirling stars. And it finally hit me that God created this. This is a lot bigger than what I thought it was. God's love is a lot bigger than what I thought it was. And it finally dawned on me for the first time, I needed someone else's goodness. I needed someone else to fight for me, to do the things I could not do. So I want to go back to verse 3 for just a, a brief second. And uh, uh, where that is, is my story, it's God's story. Because we're told in verse 3 that the Lord is a warrior. The unchanging one is a warrior. Think about a warrior for a second here. What does a warrior do? They're a fighter. They are trying to win the day. 
And I want you to think about how the unchanging I am, that he will always be this way, is fighting for you, has fought for you, and is still fighting for you until he completes the work, wins the day, victorious, proves that the battle has all been done, all been won, no more fighting, no more struggle, because the warrior was victorious. But who was the warrior? The Lord. It wasn't me. I didn't fight for my salvation. I was refusing it. My brothers are terrible. Talk to them about needing forgiveness. But God came uh, to me. God's love for the whole world, somehow he included that to be my story. So your story is God's story. The Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. Always fighting for you. And he has fought for you. And he will continue to do so because this is his story. Uh, we're going to press forward here uh, because it is not just uh, God's story, uh, but it is, your story is Moses' story. So this is a little bit fun for me, uh, but Moses, one of the most incredible characters in the Bible. You have to agree. They, you have the first five books of the Bible, and we're told even that they were written by Moses. That's incredible to think that Moses had to write all this stuff down for the very first time. How else do we hear about the story of Genesis? God creating all things good. So Moses gets to hear all this stuff. But you think about who Moses is. His name, even. We were talking about names a second ago. Think about Moses' name. It just means drawn out of the water. It's about his birth. About how he was saved when all the other Israelite boys, all the other Hebrews, all the other people of God were going to be killed. And his mom, being savvy, a very savvy woman indeed, uh, kept him quiet and until she couldn't anymore because babies get that way. Um, uh, I'm sure you could hear plenty of stories about why that is. But at that point, she says, all right, we're going to put this in God's hands. She does everything that she can and then she sends her baby in a little makeshift raft down the Nile River. Is that not a death sentence? No, it's trusting God to preserve this life. And I think she might have even strategized this a little bit because Moses is found by who? Pharaoh's daughter. The, basically an Egyptian princess found Moses and said, Ah, oh, an Israelite boy, I'll keep him for my own. And so God is preserving the life of Moses, protecting him. Uh, but this kind of makes him an unlikely person for God to use, doesn't it? Because all the other Israelites, all the other Hebrews, are spending their lives slaving for the Egyptians. And here's Moses, clearly not Egyptian. Like the same, the same way that, that you could tell other ethnicities apart in just about any part of the world. I lived in Hawaii when I was uh, in my older elementary years, and I got to the point where I knew um, that, that Chinese people and Korean people were very, very different people. Um, I didn't know that when I moved there, but I definitely knew it by the time I moved back to Indiana. So there you go. Uh, Egyptians, Israelites, clear as day. You're not the same people. So I want you to think about this. Moses, clearly an Israelite, not slaving, not working for someone else's good. If anything, he's kind of benefiting from the fact that they're slaving. He finally gets to be a man, maybe about 40, and he sees one of his Hebrew brothers or sisters uh, slaving away, and their slave master is just going to town, whipping him uh, incredibly hard. And he loses his temper rather than saying, hey, I'm part of Pharaoh's house. Knock that off. Instead of that, he kills the man. It's an anger problem, right? It's a pure evil because it's murder at the end of the day. You can't make a case that murder's not wrong. This is not war. There's nothing going on. You, you had all the authority to stop what was happening, and you chose murder? And we know this is so wrong because then he spends 40 years like a coward hiding in the wilderness. This is the one God's going to use? A coward? A murderer? Someone who was raised in a cushy lifestyle while all of God's people were slaving away? What? This person, Moses, gets to see God in a blazing, burning bush that is not consumed, so it still has these green leaves. And he gets to hear with his own ears the voice of God telling him, I am that I have always been. 
who I have always been, the great I am. And what's Moses' response? Ah, oh, I'm not worthy. Look at my life. Nope. This fool of a person that God's continually bent on using says, uh, I have a st st stuttering problem, sir. <laughs> he said, I'm not eloquent of speech. He's making excuses for the God of the universe. Does this Moses deserve this? Does this Moses deserve what's coming to him? No, absolutely not. And I think it's so easy for us to idolize those in the Bible. Like, what great heroes of the faith of the faith. We look to Hebrews eleven and it goes down the list. There's a lot of great things there. There are amazing moments of faith. There's also a lot of moments of disqualification that God overrides. He says, No, because I am the hero of your Story. And that's why I think Moses is part of the songwriting as we read this next part in Exodus 15, 4. He threw Pharaoh's chariots and his army into the sea. The elite of his officers were drowned in the Red Sea. Verse 5. Lord, your right hand is glorious in power. Lord, your right hand shattered the enemy. I want you to think about Moses' enemy here uh, and, and all this, that, uh, that he has been taking on all these things from Pharaoh, and he's scared of Pharaoh even. The reason why he doesn't want to go talk to Pharaoh is Pharaoh is the most powerful person on the planet. Moses wants nothing to do with Pharaoh. I can't help but think about that story and how uh, Moses was just coming up with something, a uh, speech impediment, I, I can't talk very well, anything to get me out of this, God, just don't make me talk to Pharaoh. But it goes on. You overthrew your adversaries by your great majesty. Think about the turn that just happened. Moses' direct enemies are God's direct enemies. God just claimed them for his own. Your enemies are my enemies, and I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to stretch out my powerful, mighty arm and shatter them. The most powerful kingdom in the world is nothing compared to me. Absolutely nothing. You think you have hard enemies? You think you have difficult trials, troubles, struggles that are impossible to overcome? I think about my own life as a, a man in his 30s with a wife and two kids. Like, oh, there's a lot of things that I can't control. Am I ever going to be able to overcome this? What about my uh, temptation to take my life in this direction or take hold of my own life and say, I'm going to determine what happens with it? Or maybe you have something in your own life that you're saying, I've done all of this and God's left me here? And you're kind of challenged to doubt God and say, what if I came up with something better, right? What if I could come up with my own way of living life? Or Maybe you're looking at your family. God, I feel like I've done everything right. Why are they not following you? Why are they not here with me at church today? I feel like there are many of us today that feel this way as if I feel like I've led the way. I feel like I've been Moses in the best possible way. But none of my family's here. Miriam's not singing a chorus alongside me. Where's my sister? Right? Where's my family? And I, I want you to see how beautiful this is the way that Moses is able to give up his enemies. They're not his. They're God's. God's taking them on. And God is the one. Read these words with me. You overthrew. God, you overthrew your adversaries. Your adversaries. By your great majesty. Once again, it's not in our strength. You unleash your burning wrath. Now we're getting into justice. What's best? What's right? What's truly good? And it consumed them like stubble. It's beautiful. There's something about trusting in God to deal with your enemies. But it's also about knowing who your enemies actually are. Because it, it, it's not the people who might stub your toe a little bit. I think stubbing toes is great. That's, that's fine. People need to stub your toe every now and then just to bring you some humility. That's wonderful. Uh, that's, that's why I work with children a lot, teenagers a lot. I love it uh, when they want to be a little brash to me. 
uh, because it takes me down a notch. It's like, I can't control a single thing you do. I can't. I can say, here's what's right, here's what's best, here are the rules. They don't care about that. <laughs> but that's not a big deal. Instead, what is a big deal are the evil powers in this world that are definitely working against me. So yes, you have Satan. I think that's an uh, undeniable enemy in this world. Spiritual forces at work against us. We can't see. Uh, Ephesians 6, uh, we uh, recently heard from Ephesians 5. The reason why we have to sing songs and hymns and spiritual songs to one another, uh, making melody with our heart to the Lord, is because the enemy wants to take away that melody. He wants to turn our songs into songs of mourning when we are those who have been made victorious by a conquering king, a God who has overthrown completely our enemy. Ephesians 6, though, if you, uh, if you don't know this, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, uh, but against the spiritual powers in the world. And it goes into a very long list of different kinds of spiritual powers in, our, in this world. One of my favorite parts, though, of the armor of God in Ephesians 6, uh, you can look it up later if you haven't been through the armor of God lately, but there's a shield that's listed. This is the only time where Satan's specifically mentioned here, and the whole part of it, it's, it's war imagery, battles happening, and Satan is firing off these flaming arrows. It's kind of a scary picture. You can picture, put yourself into a, a giant open field. You're charging towards the enemy. You don't have any archers, but they do. And they are shooting fiery arrows at you. Oh my goodness, how scary. Until you realize you have a shield. That's how shields work. It's real scary until you know you have a giant shield in front of you. The way shields worked back then. Uh, there could have been some flaming arrows, yes, but there are a couple different shields. You have this little buckle shield, this little circle thing like Captain America, um, but there's also much larger shields that cover your entire body. They're amazing. They're taller than you are, and they encompass your body. The shield of, do you remember it? Faith. The shield of faith. I trust that this is going to work, and so it does. I trust that God's going to work. And so he does. He has overthrown the enemy. God, you've overthrown your enemy. But don't get this messed up and don't miss this part because your enemy is also the sin and dwelling inside you. There are evil temptations that could rule like Pharaoh uh, who hardens his own heart. We have a temptation to harden our own hearts against the things of God and say, I think I have a better plan. What if we didn't talk to Pharaoh and we just kept hiding in the wilderness? God has a magnificent plan, and it's through your personal story. I, I can't help but think about Moses' overarching story that he goes 40 years of hiding and then 40 years of leading the most miserable grumblers in the world. <laughs> and God gets to the end of it and says, all right, you've done a lot of things that didn't work out very well, but I'm still going to let you see the promised land. You're going to get to see that this was going somewhere, and you trusted me, and that was enough. We're going to come to this in just a second here, but right now we're going to go to the next verse. Uh, yeah, this is a, <laughs> my goodness, towards the end of the song here, um, Moses' story grows. It encompasses all of them. This is not just uh, about the evil of the Pharaoh, but once again about the hero of the story, about how God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And so remarkably, we see how your story is our story. So it's God's story, God being so good. Um, but it's Moses' story, and it's a personal story. You have things in your life you would not wish on your worst enemies that God can overcome. And then your story is our story. It's a shared story. And that's why we hear these words in verse 13. And we're going to look at verse 17 and 18, the last words of the song. With your faithful love, you will lead the people. See this word. You have redeemed. Redeemed. I want you to think about the last time you were at a, a grocery store. And you have a rather full cart. And uh, they're just over there scanning and scanning. Right? Bread. Bread milk, don't put those together, chips, 
right? Whatever it is, Oreos. My daughter right now is in a big Oreo kick. So you're just filling up the cart, and you're passing along to the register person, and they are scanning every single item. And where do your eyes go? To the price point. The price is just racking up, right? <laughs> Did I really buy that much stuff? I don't, I don't remember <laughs> it, <laughs> estimating out to more than $100. What's going on? Uh, but you always have your eyes just flicker over to that little screen. It's like, oh, it's gonna, this is going to cost me something. Uh, and finally, you either had cash or you pulled out your wallet and you pay the person. You have just redeemed. You've bought something. You've purchased. And maybe it was racking up more than you thought. And I can't help but think about 400 years of God's people being in this place, stuck here. The cost that it would have been. So what was the cost? With your faithful love, you will lead the people you have redeemed. You will guide them to your holy dwelling with your strength. This is... God in his strength choosing weakness because he says the way that you're going to be redeemed is at the cost of the life of a pure lamb, Exodus 12. Uh, you may be familiar with the story of the Passover and of course this very uh, pure lamb for each and every family was slaughtered. They had a meal, yes, and this is referred to as the feast of the Passover. So they would smear the blood of the lamb over their door um, over their household, and God sent down this angel to bring down his wrath. He said that wrath consumed uh, the enemy, and this is what leads the Pharaoh, of course, to let God's people go. But as this angel that was sent by God to kill comes to this household, the angel sees the blood and passes over the house. There's not going to be any death in this house. Why? Because they've trusted in what God has provided. They've trusted in this redemption that God provided. It's amazing. So this is faithful love because it's love that purchases and keeps. You're going to eat that bag of Oreos that you just bought. All right? It's going to disappear. So that all your groceries, they're gonna, maybe some of them even go rotten because you didn't get to the milk in time or something like that. It's going to expire. Here's God's faithful love because he, at the verse 17, we get to jump to this grand ending. It's an overarching story that includes all of us in this room and those from 3,500 years ago. You will bring them in and plant them on the mountain of your possession. The promised land, right? Lord, you've prepared the place of your dwelling. Lord, your hands have established the sanctuary. We get the picture? Like, God's in charge of where this is going to be, of what this is going to be. This is going to be a new place, new creation all together. God is setting it up. We think about the word sanctuary. Many of these church gathering places would have been referred to as sanctuary, a place for God's dwelling to be. That's why it's referred to as the sanctuary. So wherever two or three or more of us are gathered, there is a holiness of God that is undeniably present. Amen? I would hope that that's true of this church because there's more than two of us here. God's here. There's zero show that has to happen for God to be a parent. But there's going to be a day when he is more apparent than these Israelites who have just crossed the Red Sea, who have seen God in a blazing inferno over their head by night, leading them where they are meant to go. More apparent than that, we're going to be with God, and we're going to be with him forever. And it's because God redeemed us once and for all, as 1 Peter 3 refers to it, that Christ died once and for all. The perfect Lamb of God died in our place, that God would pass over our sins, our mistakes, our adversaries, and the struggles that we dealt with in life and didn't trust him with. We trust him because of what Jesus has trusted. Jesus is keeping us till the very end with his faithful love. Jesus right now reigning and ruling in heaven. The last words of this song, the Lord will reign forever and ever. Don't you think that God is doing this right now? 
I know we shared some heavy things during our time of prayer, but what a comfort it is to know that right now, the Lord of all creation, our Redeemer, Jesus himself, is in heaven, ruling and reigning over everything this moment. And one day he's going to prove it to the entire world. To the entire world, including us, overcoming any and all of our remaining doubts that are just flickering there like stubble. Instead, he's going to prove it to us. And I think that's why the, the best way to, to end today as you're thinking about how this is your story, is to think about how you can tell it. I've taken about 20, 25 minutes now telling about what your story is. And I feel like it'd be very easy to walk out of here and say, I don't know what that was about. Uh, We talked about Exodus and Moses. And I think that was it. Uh, And and be like, now this is a really good barbecue, isn't it? Right, and go back to your food. Uh, So I want to make sure that you have this, uh, that your story is our story. All these people here know that they're going to reach this promised land. All of us in this room, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ to forgive you your sins, you can picture it like that house. Right outside that doorway, there's blood all across the top saying, in this place, we have one trust, one hope, one thing that overcomes everything and anything in this world, and that is Jesus. Just like Brother Ken shared a moment ago, there is nothing greater than Jesus. There's nothing that's going to undo his spilled blood in our place. And we share that story together. And so that's why we're going to end today with the ending of the Bible, Revelation 15, where we get this awesome thing. Uh, Yeah, we'll read this whole thing just for fun, but I want us to to hone in on on verse 3. So in verse 1 here, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them, God's wrath is complete. We just read about God's wrath a second ago. Uh, Now it's finally done, right? There's a lot of sevens in Revelation. Don't get caught up in them. It's a literature device, Uh, but it means we're done, complete. God created everything. Day seven, saw that everything was very good. We're doing the sevens again. Verse two, and I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea. Those who had been victorious over the beast. We're told in, in Revelation 12, it's that serpent of old back from Genesis 3, the one who deceived Adam and Eve, uh, the devil himself, right? And its image over the number of its name. And then they held harps given to them by God. And here's what happens. So great. And sang the song of God's servant, Moses, and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds. Lord God Almighty, just and true are your works, King of the nations. This is at the end, at the end of all things. All the, all, all the evils have been defeated, all the wrongs have been righted. We're about to be at that point where every tear gets wiped away from every eye by Jesus himself. And this is something that we get to sing together and tell one another together, hey, don't forget this. We have been brought out of an impossible situation, our own sin. We have been brought out of an impossible situation, our families, and and all the the drama that comes with that. All, all, All those who would seek to do us wrong, Satan himself seeking to do us wrong, to have us killed. There... There's, there's no greater comfort here than to hear from someone else who is in the trenches with you saying, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. He's the one who's going to win this battle. And we have to share that story with one another, to sing together, great and marvelous are God's deeds. He's the Lord God Almighty. Almighty. Do we know what almighty means? It's all-encompassing, all-powerful. There's nothing outside of his strength. And his strength is mine. God's salvation is mine. God's story is mine. And it's ours. We get to share in that together. Because you're going to forget. I'm going to forget. That's why we gather here together is to overcome all of our forgetfulness, all of our distractions, all of our temptations, to remind one another, to rehearse again and again the slaughtered lamb in our place who bought our redemption. We're redeemed his child, and forever I am. 
That's why we sing to one another. That's why we keep the lights on so you can see one another and sing to one another as much as we're singing to God. I'm his child. You're his child. We're his children. We belong to him. There's nothing that can be taken away from us if we belong to him. Lord God Almighty. Uh, so today, just a, a final encouragement to wrap all this up. Uh, I, I do want to encourage you to rehearse your story. It's personal. There are parts of your story that no one else has that others need to hear about. Human life is too complicated, too messy uh, to put into a, a, a single person to live out. There are parts of your life that need to be shared with those around you. And yeah, that's how we change this community. That's how we overcome uh, the devil and his practices. It's also how we lead others to see the beauty and wonder and salvation that's in Christ Jesus is by us telling our story again and again. It's God's story. It's Moses' story. It's yours. It's our story. Uh, I'll leave you with this. Uh, Revelation 12, 11, uh, speaks to this uh, so powerfully when it talks about this ancient dragon who has come down. And it says, the people of God overcome him by two parts. Love this. The blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Let's pray. God, we love you, and we thank you that we are not left to our own devices to figure out how to live this life, how to overcome the evils that we face, the, the pitfalls in our lives, but instead you provide for us a perfect Savior who is our strength who when we are weak, he is perfectly made strong. God, I, I pray that our strength would only come from him, that we would take on humility and weakness so that his glory would shine, that we would shout his praises and his exaltation and glory for all to see. God, I pray that for this church, for eternal life, that, that you would bring uh, the man of God who is meant to rehearse the gospel, that we would not grow weary, that we would remind one another in the meantime of your grace that sustains us, that pre preserves us more than the life of Moses as a baby. God, that you are the warrior who fights for us, is fighting for us, and will continue to do so until Jesus comes. And it's in his wonderful name that we all prayed. Amen.